auspicious start there. Yeah, I think we're a little bit ahead of the school, um, the like Monash timetable, um, because we had that break um, where you guys went on rural placement um, and we kept on just going with the main content. So the idea is hopefully we'll be able to finish um, mostly like pretty much everything important by week 11. Um, and then we'll be able to um, like basically just give you guys more time to actually revise stuff. So fingers crossed. Um, yeah. All right. Give it a moment longer and then we'll, we'll keep going. Alright, I think we might as well just get started because it's 7 p.m., which is quite late. <laughs> Alright, give me a second. I'm gonna leave it unlocked um, so if anyone joins afterwards, they can hop in. Okay, so symptoms are lower UTI. Okay, so it took a while to get there, but uh, we're all happy. So yeah, um, basically the sort of main split that you have between lower and upper UTIs um, is that lower UTIs give, as you might expect, symptoms that reflect changes in the lower urinary tract. So if you think about that, um, you're gonna get super pubic pain because that's pain like right neck down uh, in the bladder and the urethra itself. Um, dysuria, because there's pain um, where it's actually, um, how you say, um, like coming out in, um, in, in the urethra. Um, and then frequency, that's um, sort of just an interaction between the inflammation of the urethra and the nerve stem. So stuff like fever and chills is very systemic. So you, you'd expect that in something like a pyelonephritis where it has more access to the rest of the body. Um, what else we got here? Uh, oliguria doesn't really come into play with UTIs. Um, Flank pain, especially that sort of, um, I won't spoil it too much because I think there are other questions based on it, but flank pain um, is pretty emblematic of kidneys. Um, and nausea and vomiting is also an upper UTI thing. So really with upper UTIs, you're thinking very systemic, um, whereas with lower UTIs, it's very localized symptoms. But yeah, great job, guys. And yeah, sorry, the screen might've been frozen for part of it. So my apologies there. Uh, a little bit more on UTIs. Okay, nice. Um, we're all very, very well versed in, on um, UTIs, which is awesome. Um, nothing much more to say about this one. Um, super pubic aspirations, we don't usually use them because you have to stick a needle in there, which is not great. Um, and yeah, 10 to the five colony, colony forming units. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Like it just is what it is. Um, but yeah, the, th the other interesting sort of wrinkle there is that the threshold for um, a diagnosis in super aspirations is actually lower um, because that space of the body we typically assume is, um, is sterile um, or at least closer to sterile. Um, and so we will, like, we, it's basically more of a concern at lower numbers than in a um, midstream urine where we're catching up um, a bunch of stuff which is naturally um, colonized by bacteria to some extent. I don't know if that made any sense, <laughs> but yes. Hi as well to, the, to that person who joined. Um, basic management of an uncomplicated UTI. I promise this is the last UTI question. Perfect. All right. We, <laughs> we don't even need to revise you guys. I think you guys have got this perfectly. You guys are going to ace your, uh, any exam questions that come up. But it, so yeah, IV antibiotics are just way overkill for an uncomplicated UTI, but you could use them um, in a complicated UTI. Um, alkalinizing agents are not really useful in that case. Um, and morphine, I mean, like maybe if they have extreme pain, but that would be a very complicated UTI by that point.
So yeah. Well, with, well done to the two IDKs, which quite evidently do know their, uh, their UTI at the very least. Um, so yeah, I mean, I hinted it a little bit before, but this is sort of you know, what are the really key elements? What's the, the pattern that we want to recognize when it comes to the scenario questions? Okay, interesting. So I fooled a couple of you guys with like dropping suprapubic and flank in there. Um, so yeah, the main um, sort of kidney pain is it starts at the flank and it goes to the groin. Um, suprapubic pain is more commonly associated with the bladder and the urethra, like I said earlier with UTIs. Um, the We generally don't get a readying up the other way. So it goes down the ureters, starting at the flank and then going to the groin. Um, and that can be either for something in the ureters themselves, so typically kidney stones, um, or it can actually be in just pure kidney pathology. So you can get people with um, pyelonephritis who either present with just flank pain or radiating flank pain. Um, either of it can actually happen. But yeah, that's just a really key thing to, to understand. Well done to the people who got that one. Um, yeah, so this one is... It's always good to know when you're doing history what each of the findings actually means. So let's see if you guys do remember. Interesting. Okay, so we're pretty much all on the um, on the right track. I think somebody might have just picked everything. Um, but yeah, could anyone tell me in the chat real quick, um, if you're feeling brave, what we're actually getting at with pis on deux? Like, you know, obviously they pee twice, but what does that actually indicate physiologically? What's happening inside their body? Oh, something in the chat. Okay, um, so somebody suggested prostatic enlargement, um, which might get, might, you know, uh, constrict the urethra. Um, and that's sort of another pathway to the same basic idea, which is like urinary retention is the thing that we're actually testing. So it is, there is something that is stopping the bladder from voiding properly, which is why they need to go again. Okay, because the, the urge to go is reliant on urine being in the bladder. So if under normal circumstances, you drain your bladder completely and there's no physiological need to urinate. Whereas if you don't blend, if you don't drain it completely, your body says, okay, well, there's still stuff in there. I need to go again. Um, so stuff like prostatic en enlargement. So BPH really good um, differential for um, peers on deux and, and um, urinary retention in general, especially in um, older males. Um, but you can have all sorts of stuff. So you know, technically kidney stones getting down there can cause pis on deux. Um, and yeah, in the the um, the yellow option there is basically just straight up BPH leading to urinary retention. Um, so somebody asked, how would you ask about it in a history? That's a good question. Um, with all of this stuff, you want to like make it as non-jargony as possible. Probably the best way to do it would be, okay, do you often feel like after you urinate, you need to urinate again immediately? So not like a little while later, that might be frequency or something. Immediately after you go, do you feel like you need to go again? That's basically all you need to ask. Yeah, good questions and good suggestions. Okay, bit of a tricky one. There's like 500 different nail signs that you guys need to, to remember. Um, and they all mean slightly different things, so. Although you guys seem pretty confident, so we'll see. Interesting. Okay, maybe misplaced confidence. So um, there's a couple different ideas happening here. So um, the correct answer here is nephrotic syndrome. Um, and if you remember, that's the one in which you lose a lot of protein through your, um, your kidneys, basically. And that leads to what we call hypoalbuminemia. So lack of albumin in the blood, um, which albumin, sorry, albumin is just a really common, important serum protein. Um, and so hypoalbuminemia shows up as leukonychia, you, you really white nails. Um, the EPO deficiency and anemia, which a couple of people picked, um, they are, so those are actually the same thing, they're linked. So you get erythropoietin deficiency in chronic kidney disease, um, 
and that leads to anemia, but that would show up as pallor of the palmar creases rather than the nail. So the nails being pale doesn't really have much to do with the um, like hemoglobin content of the blood. Um, it has much more to do with the protein content of the blood. But yeah. Um, and then Freddick syndrome is a completely different thing where you probably get more along the lines of hematuria um, and maybe even um, uh, peripheral edema, edema. Yeah. Well done to IDK either for getting that one. Now this one's a histology question. Sorry, it's quite a small image, so hopefully you guys can see it. Nice. Okay. So most of us got distal convoluted tubule. Um, yeah. So I'm glad nobody people got glomerulus because that is quite distinctive. You can see one to the left here. Um, when differentiating between proximal and distal convoluted tubule, the main thing, can anyone tell me what the main thing we'd look for in histology is? Yep, a couple of people said brush border, so perfect. Um, so you can see a, a few of these tubules in this area. They have a very similar epithelium to the distal convoluted tubule that we identified, but they have a lot more fuzz in there, and that's basically going to be your PCTs. Um, there, I honestly couldn't say for sure that there's a loop of Henley visible here um, because it can be a bit hard to differentiate those. You very rarely get questions about those, so usually it'll be PCT, DCT, collecting duct, and glomerulus. Um, so yeah, glad that you guys all got the distinction there. All right. Uh, <laughs> this one is a mean question. Somebody asked me a question, I'll get to it after we're done with this one. Don't worry about it. Don't worry if you don't get this one because it's like very niche. I only included it because it has popped up on the exam before. Okie dokie. Ah, oh, wow. Okay. I'm surprised that a couple of you guys got that one. Um, you played very clear, close attention to um, the the video on kidney anatomy. Um, but yeah, so I guess there's not always a good way to do it. Um, it's probably most useful to think about it um, in terms of the segments and the, the lobes, um, because those are sort of the important functional um, divisions of the kidney. Um, so really good to people who got like the, the sequence from renal to segmental to lobar. Um, from there, it's a little bit more like arbitrary, um, but you can sort of remember that it, it alternates. So there's interlobar, arcuate, um, which sort of just goes in, well, an arch um, around that area, and then the interlobular, which branches off that. Um, and then on the way back, um, it's a lot simpler, so there's less steps in it. Uh, but yeah, don't worry too much. This one's just rote learning, um, but it, it could be useful um, if they decide to reuse that question. But yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't get to that question. I will have to this one, I promise. Okay, interesting. So a couple of people went for a couple of different ones. Um, so simple squamous epithelium, that's really um, just sort of... <laughs> Actually, so you, you wouldn't see it in, in most locations, honestly. You often get stratified squamous. Um, there's a couple of places where you do get it most prominently, I think, blood vessels. Um, pseudo stratified, that one's very, very um, sort of tied to the trachea and respiratory tract in general. Um, so you wouldn't expect to see that in the urine, ureters. Um, what you would expect to see in the ureters is transitional epithelium. So both the bladder and the, um, the ureters have um, transitional epithelium, epithelium. And that's the one that can sort of respond to pressure, which is the main reason why they have it, um, because they have to deal with all this pressure of um, the urine in that, in that system. 
Um, we had a question before, how do you distinguish collecting dust, duct on um, histology? Um, I think that one's honestly, it's a bit tricky because if you get um, certain sections, it can be very, very difficult to um, differentiate them from uh, like a distal tubule or something. Um, I think you can pro you can sort of tell a little bit by the epithelium. It can be a bit hard to differentiate, but the epithelium tends to be a little bit taller on the collecting ducts. Um, failing that, um, in a larger section, the collecting ducts will often be the larger, more linear ones. So remember, because the tubules are convoluted, they don't have big linear stripes. So if you see a big linear sort of very long oval shaped one, then it will have to be um, in almost every case, a collecting duct, okay? Easy. All right. Okay, nice. I think Raymond wrote this one, so we might be able yeah, to. Yeah, I did. Uh, well, it looks like everybody understands it already. Uh, but basically, the descending loop of Henle is only permeable to water, and it's done like this, so you can create that countercurrent system, so we can increase the osmolarity present there, and then increase uh, water reabsorption further down. Yeah. Perfect. On to the next question. Awesome. Uh, basically, yeah, so it's basically the way to remember it is that um, blood flows from the artery into the afferent arterial and then out through the efferent arterial. Just remember that E is for exit, and that's pretty much it. Okay, could press the mute button. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good thing to remember in general. So afferent is always going to be towards something. Um, efferent is away from something. Okay. Sweet. Seems everybody's a gun at this, but just basically a quick explanation is that the prostaglandins work at the afferent arterial and they act as vasodilators. So if we use NSAIDs that block this, we'll get constriction happening here. And then angiotensin 2 is a vasoconstriction on the efferent arterial. So if we use an ACE inhibitor, which blocks uh, angiotensin 2 from being created because it's the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, this will inhibit that process and lead to dilation of the effort arterial. Perfect. Um, yeah, so basically the normal range of pH in the body is between 7.35 and the upper limit is like 7.45 and with dead neutral being at 7.4 and that's not at 7 because where the body is not at 25 degrees, it's at 37, so it pushes it up higher. Yeah, so this is really useful, obviously, when you, you get to your... Um, your acid base balance questions, which I think we have a couple of later in. Um, you'd be surprised by how many people forget the reference values um, by later on. So I'm very glad that you guys all remember them.
Awesome. So uh, basically, as we know, spirulactone is our potassium spirit and diuretic and everything else is therefore not. And a um, good thing to remember is because it's a sparing, it means that it will lead to hyperkalemia and that can also have negative side effects in the body. And it's something to watch out for. Yeah, so in general, we want to... Um... We want to maximize case bearing. So actually, tell you what, can anyone tell me what um, classes between um, thiazide diuretics, um, loop of Henley diuretics, and case bearing diuretics, the other three belong to? Somebody said it's blue with thiazide diuretics. Yep. The name is not a trick in that case. Any ideas um, for in dapamide and furosemide? Okay, somebody said furosemide is loop. Um, in dapamide is a hard one. That's a, a thiazide-like diuretic. Um, so it, for all intents and purposes, basically thiazide. Um, so probably the clinical implication of this, because it can be a bit sort of like, okay, well, why do we use different ones? Or why would we bother, especially why would we bother using non-case-bearing diuretics if it's so bad to lose potassium? Um, and the reason is basically in a therapeutic context, it's better to use something that is short acting, but kind of bad for you um, to fix the problem now, and then to transition to something um, softer. So if you look at patients in hospitals, they'll often be given furosemide to like solve the problem really quick. And then they'll be given spironolactone when they go home um, or if they're in hospital for a long time and that'll sort of tide them over or keep them um, stable for a longer time. So you always got to weigh the benefits and differences. There's never, almost never at least, um, one correct treatment or one correct way to manage something. Yeah. Awesome. I see everybody got the answers to this. Um, just as such, the kidney is responsible for a huge range of uh, functions. And basically a good way to remember it is that the acronym a wet bed, which um, covers basically the main seven functions, which is acid-base balance, your water balance, your electrolyte balance, your toxin removals, your blood pressure balance, your erythropoietin production, as well as um, the activation of vitamin D. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think we haven't adequately adjusted for you guys being absolutely amazing at renal. All right. Structures of ureters, this might be a harder one, but it might also not be, so we'll see. Interesting. Okay. So most of you guys got this one. Um, I guess really this one's sort of like a little bit of a trick because um, the prostate really is the only one, uh, only other one that is a proper structural location. Um, and that's for urethral strictures um, because that's post the bladder. Um, really both red, um, yellow, and green, they're all urethral. Um, so none of them actually have anything to do with the ureters. Um, bonus points if anyone can chuck in chat what the other two locations of ureteric strictures are um but yeah so the pelvic brim is a really is a really common one um but yeah and if anyone was wondering um the other two locations are i know i haven't really given you enough time but the other two locations are the sort of calyx the pelvic o pelvi pelvi ureteric junction i think you call it um basically where the kidneys meet the ureter um because there's a bit of a narrowing there and all sorts of structures um and then at the vesico ureteric junction between the ureters and the bladder itself um yeah and in both of those cases you can get a lot of complications if things go wrong
All right, uh, this is more just of a definition kind of question. And it's basically asking which acids, uh, which acids in the body are volatile. And those are just the ones that we, the, the human body is able to excrete through, um, through or respiration. And the only one that's present that it's able to do that is CO2. Whilst everything else is produced in the stomach or fire, um, liver metabolism of amino acids, which are then buffered by um, our internal buffers to be excreted via the renal system instead. Awesome stuff. Um, basically, just remember that most things in the renal reabsorption pathway is basically reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubules due to there being those brush borders and having increased surface area. So as such, basically most up to 90% of the bicarbonate in the body and other um, electrolytes and uh, prote proteins and glucose is reabsorbed in this area. This one is a little bit, you've got a full minute for this one because it's an acid-based question. Um, I'll talk a little bit on how to approach these sort of questions a little bit later. Um, but suffice it to say, it might not be as complicated as you think it is. Um, somebody asks, I'll get to that question after we're done. I'll let you guys think for now. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> right. So, um, a couple of things going on here. I hope I haven't just done the math wrong. So, the basic idea um, is that you can go in steps with the um, with figuring out how this whole thing works. So, we have a look first of all at the pH. The pH is low, so we know it has to be acidosis. Um, and that's pretty elementary. So all of these options are acidosis. Um, I'm glad you all correctly identified it as a respiratory acidosis. And it basically it comes down to um, what is more wrong. So if it's properly compensated, there'll be some movement um, in the direction that you, um, how do you say, there'll be some movement in the corrective direction um, when you do the, uh, like when you look at the, other parameter. So if um, it's a metabolic um, acidosis, then your CO, PaCO2 will be down because the respiratory system is trying to um, compensate. Um, or like in this case, um, when you look at the, um, the bicarbonate, it's gone up um, because it's trying to compensate for the, um, the respiratory, the CO2 going up. Um, let me just check that I've done the maths right, because that might be the issue. Hold on. Oh, okay, right. I think what might have happened is so this is a a um, a, a hold on, give me a second. This is a chronic um, res respiratory acidosis compensated. So that's slightly smaller than the acute compensation. Um, so your HCO three goes up um, by basically one in 10 for your chronic versus it goes up four in 10 for your acute. Um, I think that might be the thing that tripped you guys up um, with this one. Um, but yeah, I guess like really, if you get any movement at all, it's a decent, um, sorry, I had the wrong way around. This is an acute one um, where we get a 
one increase from 24 to 25 in bicarbonate um, for the 10 increase um, from PaCO2. So the normal concentration for HCO3 is 24. Um, the, yeah, so that, that's the basic idea. Um, I guess if there's any movement at all towards correction, usually there's some compensation. Um, so I guess the, the sort of central idea is that compensation never wins. So we never get a fully, you never come, if it comes back to normal, then by definition, we wouldn't have an acidosis or an alkalosis. Um, so yeah, in this case, we can see the CO2 is elevated um, and the HCO3 is elevated as well. So the respiratory system is trying to bring us into acidosis. The metabolic system is trying to bring us back or, or send us into alkalosis. Clearly the respiratory system is winning. So it's respiratory something. Um, and in this case, the, since the metabolic system is at least trying to bring us back, um, it is um, a compensated respiratory acidosis. I will also say, to be fair, um, I've been a little bit unfair in not awarding uncompensated as well, because technically you could have HCO3 within 25 in normal um, in normal values. So theoretically, the middle value is 24, but we do see movements sometimes of that. Um, so that's probably a slip over on my part, but yeah. Um, if you're calculating compensation, you do it off the idealistic value. So um, your PaCO2 as normal um, is going to sit at um, about 40 um, and your bicarb is going to sit at 24 until they're disturbed. All right, that's a lot of word vomit. Hopefully it made at least some sense. This time we have an alkalosis um, and yeah, same principles in play to figure out what's going on here. Okay, <laughs> right, interesting. Yeah, these questions can be a little bit screwy. So I guess if we look at our values here, so 7.6, we have a pH of 7.6, um, we're in alkalosis, that's a given, okay? If it's above 7.4, like beyond our, our normal values, then it's gonna be in alkalosis. Um, oh, sorry, I've got pco 2 there twice. Mm. Um, so HCO3 is up and our pco 2 is down. So both systems are trying to bring us into some form of alkalosis, okay? Because our CO2 is down, which is gonna make it more alkaline. Uh, our bicarb is up, which is also gonna make it more alkaline. Um, so that's probably the main thing that would suggest to us that it's uncompensated, okay? Um, because if it was compensated, they'd be pulling in different directions. Um, so in our HCO3 uh, 30, that's very elevated. Um, so your normal is 24, um, maybe plus or minus two. Um, so that is definitely elevated. Your PCO2 is actually, it's barely moved from its normal value. Um, but crucially, it hasn't actually tried to compensate. So if it was trying to compensate for the metabolic alkalosis, um, then you'd see it moving upwards because you need to make it more acidic to, um, to compensate, okay? Hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, would anyone be able to tell me how we get a metabolic alkalosis? Because I think that's a bit of a tricky one. Um, it's one of the rarer um, forms of acid-base imbalance that we get. Any ideas how we could metabolically? Um, yeah, somebody said vomiting. That's really good. Um, so yeah, vomiting is a, is a really major way you lose acid in general because obviously your stomach acid. So if you have somebody who's got really excessive vomiting, um, then you might get a metabolic alkalosis. But yeah, good job. All right. Second last and yet yeah. <laughs> ECGs are not part of renal, but because we are, um, because I, I put out the video for ECG a little while ago, I thought might as well chuck a couple questions here. Uh, 
Okay, interesting. We have a couple different suggestions here. So, um, I guess, can anyone tell me what is the abnormality here, at least, um, or at least try and describe what they're seeing here? So, the fact that all the options are AV block, uh, I don't know, it's a third degree AC block, but um, yep, somebody said long PR interval. Um, and I guess, is the, is the PR interval consistent? Like, is it always the same amount of long? No. Nah. So if you look, if you actually look at the first PR interval after our dropped beat there, you can see it's actually back to four, which is not really that abnormal, or is it, it's at least a lot less abnormal than the previous ones. Um, but if you look at the one immediately before I missed beat, um, it was six more squares. Um, so that's immediately telling you, okay, it's getting like it's starting short and then it's getting longer and longer, the PR interval, and then eventually we drop a beat. So that is a classic type one block. Um, sorry, second degree type one. All right. In our first degree AV block, we would just have a long PR interval and it'd be the same length every time. And it's just sort of sluggish. Um, in our type one, like I said, we have an increasingly lengthening um, PR interval until we have a drop B. In our second degree type two, we get a fixed ratio. So it's like you'll look at the ECG and you'll have two normal beats and one drop B uh, or three normal beats and, and, and one drop B, something like that. Um, and in your third degree AV block, you'll look at the ECG and there'll be no correlation between P waves and um, QRS, com excuse me, QRS complexes. So typically the QRS will happen slower. It'll be bradycardic because your ventricles have to do the, set their own pace and they're slower. Um, and so you'll see a bunch of P waves that are, sort of, that are just sort of sitting there um, and not actually doing anything to start off the, the QRS interval, okay? Yeah, well done to the people who got that one because it can be a tricky one. Like last one is a little bit more visibly wrong. So let's see if you guys can get this one. Interesting. Okay. So I've fooled a couple of you guys. Um, yeah. So this is not really what a STEMI looks like. Okay. Um, so first of all, a STEMI, it really looks, you'll, you can't expect the um, ST segment to be as tall as the actual Q wave itself. Like that's already sort of insane. Um, but I guess the other thing is also here we get that sort of big, wide, high thing in almost every lead. Okay, um, so there's you know some sort of um, of increased size of the, of the QRS complex in a really big um, number of leaves. It'd be pretty tricky to get that sort of geographical um, pattern that we we normally talk about. Um, so what it actually is in this case is that not a STEMI and not an N STEMI, um, and not VTAC. So VTAC is a, sort of a more gross pathology. Um, this is a right bundle branch block. So you can sort of see a little bit, if you remember um, the little William Morrow um, sort of memory tool, um, you can see in V1, V2, we have a sort of M shape um, and in V5, V6, maybe a little bit of M, but sorry, a little bit of W, but not really. I wouldn't expect you to, to see a W there. Um, I guess the really big thing is you can see that this is a wide QRS complex, okay? Um, so in a STEMI, we still have a, usually a, um, a narrow um, QRX complex, okay? So it's sort of, you have your narrow QRX complex, and then when it tries to come down to ST, you have a little ST elevation, and then it goes all the way down properly. Okay, so that's what a STEMI look, looks like. A um, couple of people have asked about the, the memory technique, so I will explain it. Um, so basically, um, William and Morrow are both talking about comparisons between V1 and V2, and V5, V6. So um, the first letter of the word corresponds to V1, V2. Um, so W in a left bundle branch block and M in a right bundle branch block. And then the reverse happens for the other lead. So in a left, you can almost remember if you like write out William Morrow in front of you, William is on the left and Morrow is on the right. Okay. So on the left, left bundle branch block, um, V1, V2, we have a W and V5, V6, we have an M. Um, in a right bundle branch block, um, V1, V2, we have an M, V5, V6, we have a W, okay? Um, so in terms of where you look for M and W in, um, it's just the QRS complex, 
Um, and that comes down to, it's basically like, we just have a desync of the two ventricles. Um, and that shows up as an M, like, I think honestly, I see a lot more Ms than Ws. Um, but the the M basically comes across comes about because these two waves, which used to be like with each other, and you'd see one coordinated really big spike. Instead, that's separated into two small spikes, which are slightly displaced from each other, and then together they form an M shape. Um, yeah. So hopefully that makes sense. Feel free to ask me if that doesn't, um, because I'd be happy to, to clear it up for you guys. But otherwise, um, yeah, that's pretty much everything. Um, yeah. I think we might as well see who won. There's a little bit of movement right at the end, so let's find out. All right, well done to Claire. Um, also, kudos to you for using your actual name, Nico Hoots, because I feel like I was never brave enough to do that myself. Um, so yeah. You should be happy with that, all of you guys, honestly. Um, you guys got all of the really foundational questions, um, just looking at a couple of the other sort of concepts and figuring out how to shore them up. So yeah, um, we're gonna stop the recording there. If you have questions, feel free to stick around and ask us, and we're happy to just talk a little bit about renal stuff. Um, other than that, thank you very much and have a great night.